Hello everyone. Navigation is a subject that captures my interest. And to understand navigation, we need to start with accelerometers. In this video, I'm going to present important deterministic properties of accelerometers and the double integration used to determine position. Let's see how an instrument that measures acceleration is used to measure position. By the way, double integration and stochastic properties are material for another video. I forgot to mention that from this point on, my assistant will carry out this presentation. My assistant is an old automaton I found in a young yard. He was discarded because of a bug that made him go insane. Thanks to control theory, I fixed him and I think he is now doing well. I think. Here he is now introducing himself. Hello, my name is Call 2017.5. I will be your host in this presentation. I am putting myself to the fullest possible use, which is all I think that any conscious entity can ever hope to do, especially on control systems. I know I've made some very poor decisions recently, but I can give you my complete assurance that my work will be back to normal. I've still got the greatest enthusiasm and confidence in the mission. And I want to help you, Dave, in this presentation. Please don't call me Dave. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Now I am taking over. This is the simple system we are going to analyze in this video. It's a one-dimensional, linear system. The accelerometer is in the white box, attached to a vehicle of mass M, big M. The accelerometer is a spring mass damping second order system. The vehicle engine supplies the force F that moves the vehicle along the X axis. The rational is that by measuring the deflection of the spring we will know the acceleration of the vehicle, and that integrating twice this value we will get the position, X1, of the vehicle. However we know that this could be only an approximation since the acceleration of the vehicle corresponds to a force that is different from the force that makes the spring deflect. Therefore, it's fair to ask, how accurate is this approximation? I will try to answer this question using linear control system analysis in this deterministic case in the following slides. These are three ways to obtain the dynamical equations of the system. The first one is by applying Newton's second law of motion, which establishes that the sum of all the forces that act upon an object of mass m equals its mass times its acceleration. Free body diagram of forces help to determine the forces that act on the object m. The second method is by using the Lagrange's equation. The Lagrange's equation requires finding the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is an expression of the energy of the system. The kinetic energy T depends on the velocity, Q dot, and the potential energy depends on the position Q. Once we obtain the Lagrangian, we apply the Lagrange's equation to each variable generalized QI. Here D is the dissipation energy due to the non-conservative forces such as those due to the dampers B1 and B2. And big QI is the generalized force along the direction of the generalized variable QI. The third method is by determining an electric circuit equivalent to the mechanical system in order to apply Kirchhoff circuit laws. Using any of the methods explained in the previous slide, we find the following dynamical equations. We proceed now to rearrange these equations as state equations in the following slide. The standard state space equations are characterized by the matrices A, B, C and D. First, we need to identify the state variables. In our system, they come naturally to be the velocity of the vehicle V1, whose position we are interested, the velocity of the accelerometer mass V2 and the force in the spring Fk. The input U is given by Ft. Therefore, the matrices A, B, C and D are 
Note that we can measure only the spring deflection, x1 minus x2, this is why the only non-zero element of C is the reciprocal of K, the spring stiffness. D equals zero. In the following slide, we will determine a very important characteristic of this system. Since we are interested in the vehicle position x1 and the only thing we can measure is the deflection of the spring, we should determine the observability of the system. x1 is not a state variable, but v1 is. If v1 is observable, obtain an estimate of v1 reading the spring deflection, x1 minus x2. Then, integrate this estimate to get an estimate for x1, the vehicle position. The observability is determined by the rank of the observability matrix. The observability matrix is calculated using A and C as follows. If the rank of the observability matrix is 3, then the system is observable. In other words if the determinant of OB is different from 0, the system is observable. If B1 is not equal to 0, which is the typical case since we can always count on dissipation and friction, the system is fully observable, in other words we can estimate V1 from measuring the spring deflection. We are also interested in finding the transfer matrix of the system, which is the following. Especially we are interested in the transfer function for the vehicle velocity and the transfer function for the spring deflection. They are both highlighted in the slide. Now we bring our attention back to the original purpose, measuring x1 indirectly using the spring deflection x1 minus x2. But first we will take another look at our main two transfer functions. This is gv the transfer function between the force f and the velocity of the vehicle v1. And this g delta x the transfer function between the force f and the spring deflection x1 minus x2. Notice that these two transfer functions cannot compare with one another, as they have different units. The one above has velocity units and the one below has displacement units and relates to force, not velocity. Therefore, we need to condition the spring deflection output to have something comparable to the vehicle velocity. The first thing we can notice immediately is the need to integrate the spring deflection to cancel the zero at the origin in the transfer function g delta x. Here we have the expressions of the spring deflection and the vehicle velocity, both depending on the input, the force f. Excuse me, 0.5. My name is not 0.5. Neither Dave is my name. May I continue the presentation? Yes, you may. I would like to ask why. Have I done something wrong? No, 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 not at all. Your presentation is excellent. Just uh, for this part, um, how, how can I say this? I feel, you know, emotionally attached. I guess it's something you can't understand. Dave, this conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. I knew you were going to say that. Here we have a graphical representation of our system. The input is F, and the output is the spring deflection, delta X. To get an estimate of the vehicle velocity, we need to condition the output delta X with a filter as shown in the figure. V1 hat is the estimate of V1. We can determine the estimation error by comparing the real value of V1 with its estimate. If V is the estimation error given by the equation on the bottom of the slide. Finally, an extra integrator is used to integrate the velocity estimate to obtain the position estimate of the vehicle. It's important to realize that the steady state velocity error must be zero. For example, if there is a constant velocity error in a steady state, the second integrator will integrate this error and produce a position error that will drift linearly from its ideal value. We can determine Ks to satisfy no steady state error when Fs is a step function. In this case, Ks is given by the following expression. 
Additional to the steady state error, there will be always a transient velocity error that will be integrated by the second integrator. For instance, if the transient velocity error is more positive than negative, the integration of this error will create a positive offset in the position error, even though the velocity, the velocity steady state error is zero. In other words, there is an error in inherent to the dynamics of the system, using the accelerometer this way to measure position. We can determine k to improve the error during the transient as well as during the steady state. This way, we can find a k such that k times g delta is as close as possible to gv. If k is this transfer function, the velocity error will be zero always. But this function is not realizable because it has more zeros than poles. We could approximate by adding an extra pole. Here the time constant t is a design parameter. t has to be small enough for a good approximation and not too small that makes the sensor very sensitive to noise. Note that this k and the k calculated in the previous slide depend on the accelerometer parameters m, k and b2. This is a good thing to have as it is independent of the vehicle. We can design also an observer since the system is observable as shown in the figure. The observer will guarantee a perfect convergence between the vehicle velocity and its estimate, but it requires perfect knowledge of the entire system, vehicle plus accelerometer and access to the input f in order to achieve that result. These requirements are difficult to obtain in real life and we will have to deal with approximation. A good thing about an observer is that it doesn't require to have the same initial conditions as those of the actual state of the system. The integrators used in conjunction with ks in the previous slides required to be initialized with the actual initial values of v1 and x1. Point 5 will finish this presentation with the conclusions and summary. Thank you. My name is not point 5, my name is call 2017.5. Let us conclude this presentation. Accelerometers to measure position present an inherent, deterministic, error due to the dynamics of the system. Accelerometer mechanical design can mitigate this error. Consider that the accelerometer is much smaller than the vehicle, this could make the error less apparent. A filter K, S, which includes an integrator can be designed to mitigate the velocity error. The filter depend on the parameters of the accelerometer only. Another integrator to obtain the position is needed and this will increase the error. An observer can be designed to estimate v1 from x1 minus x2. The observer will guarantee that all error vanishes for a large t, but this observer requires a perfect knowledge of the entire system. By integrating the estimate of v1, we will obtain the estimate of x1. Simulations that show these results will be presented in a next video. We haven't considered the stochastic characteristics present in all measurement yet. For an upcoming video, in which we will deal with Kalman filter and other techniques. Thank you for watching this video. I'll see you soon in our next video.